Uh, Dave McMenamin covers the NBA for the Mothership. He's covering the Nuggets and the Lakers. It'll be game four tonight at 8.30 Eastern on ESPN. Before we talk about this series, Dave, if I said you could have the career of Carmelo Anthony or Christian Leitner, the entire basketball career, Melo just announced his retirement. I don't know if you can see the jersey behind my, my shoulder there. Dan, I'm a little biased. I went to school with Carmelo Anthony. There's no way <laughs> I would ever pick uh, Christian Leitner in this scenario. Uh, so I had to recuse myself from uh, the, uh, answering that with uh, an unbiased heart there. But um, you know, obviously, multiple championships for, for Christian Leitner and Duke. But Carmelo Anthony had uh, what a ride, the best freshman season in the history of NCAA tournament, and he follows it up with a multi-time Olympic gold medalist. Obviously, all the scoring accolades he had at the height of his powers with the Nuggets and the Knicks in particular. And uh, yeah, what a what a career! All right, Carmelo Anthony or Andre Iguodala? Wow, Andre Iguodala's best success was as a role player on a championship team. Obviously, the finals MVP yeah. in 2015 is a significant accomplishment, but I don't think Andre Iguodala, I, both those players, again, tremendous careers for both of them, they never reached the height of basketball skill and I, I guess the weight that is on one's shoulders as a star yeah. uh, that Carmelo Anthony reached. You got a story from uh, Carmelo in college? Uh, I mean, and, and the last time I saw him was uh, in late March. Uh, the last home game ended up being for Coach Jim Beheim against Wake Forest. And uh, just everyone you recognize as you get older, how rare and special something like that is. And all the dominoes that need to fall uh, in order for not just Carmel Anthony to end up at Syracuse at that time, but Jerry McNamara to be there and Akeem Warwick to be there. And, um, some of the great coaches on that that team, Troy Weaver and Mike Hopkins, uh, who has gone on, both have gone on to tremendous success in their own right. I, I guess the memory just sticks out. We are all in the, the, the green room after there was a watch party the night before the Wake Forest game, and Carmelo Anthony is pouring wine out of a wine label that he owns <laughs> everyone is sharing in his wine the last time i shared a drink with him on campus at syracuse university we both had you know sharpie marker marks on our, on our wrists so we could get in to buy you know dollar beers from from chucks and so to have that come full circle in 20 years uh, struck out struck me all right game tonight the Lakers are favored by three. I feel like they'll win by two or lose by 20. Um, what is Denver doing so successfully that the Lakers have a hard time counteracting? First of all, they are destroying the Lakers on the offensive boards. And that's not just Nikola Jokic. It's their front line of Aaron Gordon and Michael uh, Porter Jr. Uh, constantly applying pressure to the, the Lakers uh, when it comes to rebounding and you give this Nuggets team extra possessions, they're smart with it. You know, one of the easiest shots in basketball is a three-pointer off of an offensive rebound. Usually you're catching it in rhythm and you're wide open. And also the next thing I would mention is the Nuggets three-point shooting has been much better than the Lakers. And that's not a surprise because the Lakers shooting really has been something that's come and gone over the entire season, both pre-trade deadline and post-trade deadline. But that said, game one's a six-point game. Game two is a five-point game. Game three, the Lakers have a lead in the third, in the fourth quarter, I should say, until the Nuggets go on a 13-0 run in a three-minute span. In a blink of an eye, the thing's over. Uh, there are people within the Lakers organization that I was speaking to over the last 48 hours that certainly still are holding on to hope, still are holding on to belief. Um, looking to go into game four, make something happen, extend the series, and you never know. And then, you know, I like what uh, the Joker said. He's like, hey, we got to keep going. They got LeBron. You know, you, you can't – unlike the Celtics, the Celtics I don't think respect the Miami Heat. They Maybe Jimmy Butler, but they don't respect the supporting cast. You know, I, I like what Joker said. Hey, you know, we got to keep going. They have LeBron here. But this is a different LeBron that we've seen – He's relying on the three. 
and they're making him work at the other end. Um, how much does he have? Like, does he have that 40 point game in him or the potential for that now? I don't think that would be the Lakers best recipe for success. Um, thinking that that would be the way they would extend this thing. LeBron pulls a 40 pointer out of a, out of a hat. I mean, he was tremendous in the closeout game against the golden state warriors where he went for 30 plus, but that's yeah. the only 30 plus playoff game he's had since the 2020 bubble. Uh, he's defensive efforts and impact on Nikola Jokic in particular have been remarkable. It's not, it's not like he's having a bad series in the overall sense um, but he is not the 40 point score he once was. And that's, listen, his peers are retired. Dwayne Wade is hosting uh, a game show. Carmelo Anthony just uh, hung it up. Uh, LeBron is still competing in the Western Conference finals. Um, that's no small feat, just making that statement. Yeah. Uh, but to expect him at 38 years old, 20 years into this thing, to be the 40 point score, I think you look to number three, Anthony Davis, who scored 40 in game one to be that guy. Yeah, and then I wonder, you know, is it worse to get swept in the Western Conference Finals or, you know, not make the playoffs or bow out in a, you know, a play-in game? Well, that goes to the LeBron-MJ argument that's been made for years. Well, MJ's six for six in the finals. What about all the years he didn't make the finals that man? You know, LeBron to get to the finals 10 times is an accomplishment in itself. And uh, I, I would think playing competitive basketball is really what is continuing to throw fuel on the furnace inside of him uh, to try to extend this thing to year 21, to year 22, perhaps beyond that. And uh, these games, the more he can get them this time of year, the more he's going to be motivated in August and September to get his body right for, for tip off of, of training camp. Are they going to be able to keep Austin Reeves? Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, they've, uh, he's a restricted free agent. He fits everything in their culture that they'd want um, in terms of competitiveness, in terms of ability to play in the modern NBA, uh, in terms of the, the pride factor that he's basically a homegrown talent, someone identified as an undrafted player coming out of Oklahoma. And uh, there could be a, a number that seems pretty big. It could be like $20 million a year. Uh, but when the new CBA kicks in, that number actually will seem pretty amenable. Can you explain the Miami Heat culture, the makeup? that I think their undrafted players are averaging over 60 points in this series against Boston. How do you explain well, that? I mean, you start with Pat Riley, and you filter down to you know, very smart people like Andy Ellisberg, who've been there for forever in the front office, and Eric Spolstra, and uh, that's the trend written when it comes to you know, the brain trust. And then they still have standards that I don't think other teams employ quite so often. I mean, they're still making you do fitness tests and checking your body fat levels with like pinchers. You know, like that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't happen too often in uh, modern society, uh, even in the NBA. Yeah. Uh, so I think you start there and, and then they recruit and they identify players based on competitive makeup. And, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily jump off the page in athleticism or shooting percentages or all the other metrics that we're so accustomed to judging players by. Uh, you got to really kind of know your sport, know the psychology of it, know the people in it in order to succeed in that that manner. And obviously, Jimmy Butler uh, is the prototypical Heat athlete. And you know, all credit to him on the court, obviously. Um, you, it, it, It's so fun watching him play because if you are watching a Heat game, they're down 12 with four minutes to go in the, in the fourth quarter. Oh, is Jimmy playing? Yeah, okay, they got a chance. Yeah. They got a chance, and like that's what makes these games worth watching. Well, that's why when ESPN came out with their analytics and said the Heat had a 3% chance, you're not factoring in Jimmy Butler. You're not factoring in experience. You're not factoring in Eric Spolstra. And uh, is it now flipped? Is it 97% for the Miami Heat and 3%, or is it even 3% for the Boston Celtics? 
I can't. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess it's higher than three percent. Maybe I give him a ten percent shot. I mean, if you get game four, you go back to Boston for game five. Yeah, but you, you got to do then, something that's never been done before, and you're doing it with yeah. this group who they're they're just so inconsistent. I mean, but we used to watch the NCAA tournament, Dan, and, and the 16th seed had never beat a one seed. And and now, does that seem like such a far-fetched idea over what, after watching the tournament the last few years? I, I'm not so sure. And now, Okay, but who has the, a better chance then, the Celtics to come back or the Lakers to come back? I would say the Lakers. Uh, all those games have been close. They didn't okay. lose by 30 points in a game three, uh, even though it was, I think, 11, the final margin of game three. Uh, I would give the Lakers a better chance. I don't think either team is going to do it, uh, but if we're going to see one of them, then pull it off and pick the Lakers. Have fun tonight, Dave. Thank you again for joining us. Anytime, Dad. Dave McMenamin covering the uh, NBA for the Mothership. 8.30 Eastern, Game 4 tonight.